Hello and welcome to our webinar, Legal Tools for Decision Making. My name is Lucy Gerland. I'm a caregiver specialist with the Fairfax Area Agency on Aging. And I will introduce our speaker in just a moment. I wanna let you know a few things about the uh, webinar. You um, can ask questions at any time during the webinar by typing your question in the um, questions bar that you have there. And um, our speaker will be happy to address your questions. Okay, um, so without any further ado, I'll introduce Ed Zetlin. Edward Zetlin, um, we are very fortunate to have him with us today. He brings years of experience to elder law and special needs planning. He has a solo practice in the areas of elder law, special needs law, guardianship, conservatorship, public benefits, estate planning, and estate administration. So currently he's serving as a member of the board of directors on the Autism Society of Northern Virginia. He's been an adjunct professor of law. He was named a fellow of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys and um, he also, in Virginia, helped establish the Virginia Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. He's past president of that association and served on its board for many years. Ed also co-chairs the Arlington County Bar Section on Law and Aging, and he has taught and written for lawyers, law students, and laymen on a variety of elder law and special needs planning issues. So I'm very happy to have him with us today. And um, Ed, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lucy. I am delighted to uh, coming to you all. I, uh, as Lucy was saying, I've been doing this for quite a while. I was, uh, before in private practice, I was um, worked for legal services of Northern Virginia and was Council for the Elderly in Arlington and managed our, count, our, our elder law section. So um, I'm very familiar with Fairfax, Arlington, Alexandria, Prince William Loudon, uh, systems of aging and, and services. So I'm always happy to uh, support and work with an aging, uh, the AAAs, the uh, uh, aging and disability um, 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 uh, departments for uh, for Fairfax. So um, so today we're going to talk about uh, legal tools for actually future decision making. Really, not enough line of space to put in there. Uh, and what we're talking about is you putting documents into place that it would exist now when you are healthy and able to do so, so that should things happen in the future while you're still alive, that uh, you would have in place tools in which uh, other people could step in and make decisions as you would want them to make. So that's what this um, um, uh, little seminar is about. And you can see where I, my address and where I work. I do a great number of powers of attorneys and medical powers of attorneys and advanced directives. They are really, it's almost malpractice to do a will or do an estate plan without discussing these particular issues. So uh, any attorney is gonna bring these issues up if you're going to an attorney to talk about estate planning. Uh, so don't be surprised if they bring them up and ask to see if you've done these documents in the past, they will want to see these documents. I ask clients to bring in the documents they've done in the past because I want to make sure that they have the kind of things that I think are needed for future decision making. So let's now get into the particular tools and what we're talking about in more detail. And uh, I like to think about these things uh, in, two, in two parts. One is the financial tools, and the other is the medical tools. So 
so one is for financial decision making and one is for medical decision making. The basic tools for financial decision making is the general durable power of attorney uh, and the revocable trust. Each of them are separate kinds of documents. We'll talk about each of them, but I just wanted you to understand the distinction. So there is a general durable power of attorney, which everyone really needs to do. And then in certain circumstances, it may be advisable to do a trust or revocable trust that everybody everybody needs a revocable trust. It depends on how comfortable someone is with regard to doing a trust. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And then the second uh, part of, uh, of decision-making has to do with medical decision-making. And they, the basic tools are the medical power of attorney, which is like the general durable power of attorney, except that it deals strictly with medical issues. And then the advanced medical directive, which um, uh, in past ages, it used to be called a living will. We don't really use that term anymore. But uh, I will try to bring out the distinction between a medical power of attorney and advanced medical directive when we get to that section. So hang on if you have questions about that. Okay, so why are we doing these tools? What's what's the the reason that we're, what is the the sort of evil or bad thing that we're trying to avoid by doing these tools. And the way I like to explain this to uh, students, uh, to uh, clients, and even to other attorneys who don't work in this area, is that we're trying to avoid ever having to need a guardianship or conservatorship. So what is a guardianship or conservatorship? It is the court imposition of the appointment of a decision maker when someone is incapacitated and hasn't used these other documents to so appoint somebody. In Virginia, under Virginia law, the guardianship, the guardian is the personal decision maker. Okay, so we have a guardian who is the personal decision maker and a conservator is the financial decision maker Oftentimes, these are the same people, um, um, but we, we use the word guardian for personal decisions and conservatorship for financial decisions. In both of these cases, the court must find you incapacitated. That is, there must be a court hearing determination of your incapacity, and only then, uh, and, and the court determines that you're not able to do any of these documents that we're going to talk about. So there's no choice but to appoint a, uh, a substitute decision maker. And the problem is, the, the, the real problems that we're trying to avoid is these are expensive. So I just did a guardianship or I was appointed counsel for someone this uh, um, last week. And let's see what the costs were. Where are the the petitioner was charging about $3,500. Um, there was a guardian ad litem that was another $3,000. My fee was around $2,000. So let's see, that's almost $10,000 to do a guardianship or conservatorship. And that money is coming from, to pay all those fees, it's coming from the incapacitated person's estate. So it's expensive to have to go that route when you could have done a document for some hundreds of dollars as compared to that amount, it's pretty expensive. It's public, so we go before the judge, it's in front of the judge, and the, the court may appoint someone you may not choose. Um, in this case, the court appointed a relative because a relative stepped forward. Otherwise, the court may have appointed the petitioning attorney who uh, works for uh, Virginia Hospital. He's a very good attorney, but that probably wouldn't have been the person that that person that would have appointed uh, had they done a power of attorney. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, and now let's begin to talk about the documents themselves. So I 
think the basic planning document that we use is the general durable power of attorney. So this is a document that is signed by you, the adult, you're called the principal, and you authorize another person, another adult, has to be an adult under Virginia law, called the agent, to act on the principal's behalf. Okay, we use the word durable because the power lasts even if the principal becomes incapacitated. And the important thing to understand is the power of attorney can only be done when the person, the maker of the document, has capacity. They know what they're doing. They know who they want to appoint. Uh, so you have to have capacity. If you're already so sick that you really would not legally uh, know who you are going to appoint or what your assets are, that's too late, and then we have to fall back to a conservatorship. So think of the durable power of attorney as a private agreement between the principal and the agent. The agent that's appointed has a fiduciary duty. And I'm going to be using this term a lot, fiduciary duty. And that means the agent must act for the principal's benefit and not for their own benefit. If the agent breaks that fiduciary duty, then they could be sued for breach of duty. We'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit longer. And probably the most uh, difficult issue for for people in this uh, in doing this is who are they going to appoint as an agent? Often, if it's a if it's a couple um, um, and both have capacity, they're going to appoint each other. Uh, but then they're going to need to think about appointing successor agents, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So what kind of authority does the agent have in the power of attorney? The typical kind of powers that an agent would have under the power of attorney is to, under the durable, durable power of attorney, and here we're talking about financial matters, is to manage bank accounts and other assets that the principal owns. Uh, so they would have now authority to go to your bank, go to your broker, uh, uh, deal with any other uh, assets that you may have and deal with them just as you would deal with them. Uh, they would also have authority to manage the principal's real estate, okay? So they would be in charge of ensuring that your property is protected and and maintained. And they, of course, also can enter into contracts for you. So, for instance, if you needed to do, if the, if the agent needed to do something for your house, uh, they could enter into a contract just as you could. Or if you needed to sell the house, they could enter into a contract to sell your house just as you could. So think of all of the financial powers that you do now for yourself. You're giving authority to the agent to do, which is uh, certainly a great deal of authority. So, you know, you're going to have to think about who are you going to appoint. We'll talk about that. But obviously, this is a great amount of power. And in addition to that, there are special powers that I specifically talk to clients about. Uh, the three special powers that we talk about are gifting powers. So if you want it to allow the agent to make gifts, that needs to be discussed with, the, uh, with you and your attorney discussing this about what kind of gifting they would do, what should they do, why should it be done, and so forth. Uh, you can also have the agent under the power of attorney create trust for you. So you can give the agent authority to create a trust uh, just as you can create a trust, but that's a very, also a very powerful kind of clause, and so I would want to talk about that. And an equally powerful clause is changing beneficiary designations. Um, so um, um, there is, there has to be a, some thought about that because there's always the concern that the agent may again act for themselves and not act for you, 
if they have to change bene beneficiary designation. So it does become important that the agent that you pick understands their fiduciary duty. Um, so let me go on uh, to the next area. So that's the agent's authority to act. So here are some of the issues that you need to think about. When does the agent act? Should they act immediately? Should they have authority? Let's talk about it. Should they have authority to act immediately when you sign the document? Or there should be a springing authority? And I'll explain the difference. So in almost 99% of my general powers of attorney, I give the authority of the agent to act immediately. Now, that doesn't mean the agent has to act. So we may do, you may do a power of attorney in which you're appointing an agent to act and say to the agent, I've appointed you as my agent, but I can act now. I'm not incapacitated. You only need to act when I really can't act for myself. So that's a, a, an understanding that you and the agent have that says the agent is only going to be able to act when you no longer can, can act. And there's that kind of understanding. Um, a springing power of attorney goes into effect only when the principal becomes incapacitated. There's a clause in there that says that when the principal becomes incapacitated, only then can the agent act. The problem with that is you have to have some mechanism that determines when the person is incapacitated. So that has to be built into the document. And it also sometimes makes the document more difficult to use because a third party is going to be looking at this document, a bank, a broker, and they're going to want to know whether or not the incapacity has occurred and who's determined that. So um, oftentimes we rely upon the, the, the good association between the, the principal and the agent. So who do you name? Who should you name as an agent? Well, some of the issues is um, you want to name a person who has some knowledge they don't need to know all of the law. They can go to an attorney and get advice, but they have to be uh, at least savvy and knowledgeable about taking care of basic financial things. They should be good at record keeping. There's sometimes an issue between uh, should they be somebody who is close to you here versus somebody who you would like, but they are far away. Uh, and that's an issue that really you have to take up with your attorney as to if that's an issue, what should you do? How should you handle that particular issue? And that rests upon very factual issues about who you might want to name. You also want to think about, is this person responsible? So they're going to have, it's no great benefit to be an agent. There's a lot of responsibility. So are they willing and able to take on that kind of responsibility when the time comes? And of course, the most important thing is, are they going to be trustworthy? You know, if you've named somebody you, who's not trustworthy, uh -huh. go ahead. Okay, I think we lost you for a moment there. You were talking about knowledge versus closeness. Um, oh, okay, you're still on, yeah. can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So, um, so there is an issue about knowledge versus uh, closeness. Uh, do you name somebody who is very knowledgeable and you'd want to name, but is not so close to you, uh, versus naming somebody who is close to you but probably not as competent as the person who's farther away? Those are issues that simply have to be discussed and worked out. Uh, I just mentioned that as an issue to think about. And then there is, I think, you've got to name somebody who's responsible and you've got to name somebody who you trust. I mean, the, uh, although you, the person has a legal duty, a fiduciary duty act for you, if the agent, you know, withdraws all the money from your bank account and goes to Tahiti, that's not very helpful. So you want to make sure 
whoever you know, whoever you're going to name is a trustworthy person. And so you're going to name an agent, and then you're going to have to think about naming successor agents. And all of these issues about knowledge, responsibility, trust, also apply to the successor agent. So, and you can even add a successor to the successor agent, or you can name two acting agents. So there's a great deal of flexibility as to who you can name. You don't have to name somebody in Virginia. You can name somebody outside of Virginia. Uh, uh, it, it does have to be an adult. You can name a relative. There's no issue about not naming a, uh, an adult child or obviously your spouse. Or um, uh, in some cases, uh, you may decide to name an attorney uh, to be the agent. When attorney serves agents, they have special duties and special forms that have to be signed because there's always the issue of the agent of the of the attorney suggesting themselves, and that's something that the the bar has gotten into. But that can be done. I, in fact, serve as an agent for some of my clients uh, in certain circumstances when we both think that's a good idea and would work uh, work well. Um, okay, so what terminates an agent's authority? When you die. When you die, the power of attorney ends, okay? And then the handling of your principal as a state is handled by the executor if you've done a will or by administrator if you've not done a will. So um, um, the important thing to understand is we're really talking about two different time periods. In this lecture, we're not talking about where your assets go upon your death. That's for another lecture. We're talking about how to manage your financial affairs and how to make medical decisions while you're alive. And so the power of attorney is the mechanism to do that should you become incapacitated, okay? So here we're talking about the time period when you're alive but can't act for yourself. When the principal dies, only then does the will come into place and does that determine where your assets go. Uh, the other way of termination of, of an agent is by resignation. The agent is allowed to resign. And then you can fire the agent. If you have capacity, uh, the principal retains the option of executing a new power of attorney and appointing a new agent. And I, you know, we, some, we often do that. Oftentimes, uh, if they've done an agent at one time and they, something's happened to that agent, They've become incapacitated. We have to new, do a new power of attorney and appoint a new agent. In cases where the agent has gone off the rails and a person has come to me, I've had to fire that agent and then do a new power of attorney and then go to the banks and make sure the bank knows that that former agent is not able to act anymore for them. So uh, that doesn't happen that often, but the, the principal retains the power, the authority to fire the agent and appoint a new agent. Okay, Ed, I have um I have a couple of questions here. Sure. Go ahead. So um the first question is if you're in the unfortunate situation of having getting back to this court appointed um person um yes. you know if if you didn't make arrangements and you wind up with a court appointed uh, guardian um, what if you don't like who the court appoints or you are a family member who feels that the legally appointed person is making bad or wrong decisions for the senior for the well that's going to mean that's going to mean somebody's going to have to go back to court and litigate that issue before the judge okay so everything in a guardianship or conservatorship is in the end determined by the judge and if mm -hmm. uh so, so pre-planning is is really critical so, you, you, so all of those issues you know that means there's going to be a a, a fact-finding by the judge a hearing and so forth so 
Think of it as just basic litigation in that case. And you had a second question, okay. I think? And the, yes. Um, is it a good idea or not to have the uh, power of attorney also be the executor of your estate? Yeah, oftentimes I... Uh, we name the agent under the power of attorney to also be the executor. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I do that all the time. So that's fine. That can be done. Doesn't have to be that way. Okay. You could name somebody else, but I often do that. Okay. All right. So Yes, thank uh, you. And I will take this opportunity, go ahead, uh, to remind participants that you can ask your question in the questions panel. Just type it in. Thank you, Ed. Go ahead. All right, so let's go on. We're now going to talk about the revocable trust. Now, this is a more complicated kind of document to talk about. Um, the purposes of a revocable trust is two. One, it's, is it, it is used for estate planning. So uh, in the revocable trust, I'm going to deal with where your property goes upon your death. So there is a certain amount of estate planning uh, that goes into revocable trust, but it's also used for incapacity planning. So uh, it also deals with the issue that when the trust maker becomes incapacitated, the property in the trust can be managed by the trustee. So what's the definition of revocable trust? It is where one person called the grantor or the maker of the trust transfers legal title of their assets under the trust, which are then managed by another person called the trustee, and they manage the property in the trust for the benefit of the beneficiary. Now, here's the tricky part. Oftentimes, at the original point, the grantor, the trustee, and the beneficiary are the same person, okay? So you create a trust, you appoint yourself as the trustee, and you are the beneficiary of the trust. You as trustee are managing your assets in the trust for your benefit, and that's done all the time. Or there is a joint trust by you and your spouse in which you both transfer you both create a joint trust, and then you transfer assets into that trust. Both of you act trustees, and both of you, both of you are, are the beneficiary. The assets in the trust are owned by the trust. So if you transfer your house into the trust, you do it by deed. You actually transfer the ownership of the house into the trust. And then you as grantor, you retain the authority to, remand, to amend, restate, and of course you can revoke the trust at any time. Um, so why would you do this complicated trust? Well, one thing is if you're doing a trust, you're not just naming yourself as trustee, you're naming successor trustees. So that if you become incapacitated, the successor trustee can then manage the assets in the trust just like the agent can manage it, except it's more formally done because the, the, the trustee actually has title. They, the trust actually owns the assets. Your bank accounts are going to be retitled into the name of the trust. So sometimes that makes it a little bit easier for a successor trustee to act. All right, so we're going to go on. How does the trust work? As I said, the trustee has legal title over the assets, but again, the trustee has a fiduciary duty to manage the assets for the designated beneficiary. The designated beneficiary is often the grantor, and then the trust is going to name contingent beneficiaries. So if the grantor dies, then you're going to name other beneficiaries who the trustee is going to manage those assets for. So we might do a trust in which you do a trust and you name you and your spouse, uh, but you have uh, minor children. If both you and your spouse were to die, then the trustee would manage those assets for your children. 
uh, until they reach a certain age, all of which would be explained in the trust. And then at a certain age, you might say at this point, the trustee is ordered to end the trust and distribute all the assets out to those contingent beneficiaries. So that's often how it's used. Now I said your children, but it could be used for grandchildren. It could be used for other people. You know, a trust is flexible as to how you want to use it and whom you want to name and so forth. So there's a certain amount of flexibility that comes into a trust. And again, you're going to name successor trustees. Who's going to have the authority to manage the trust assets? Uh, you're going to deal with the issue of a resignation or incapacity of both the grantor, that has to be dealt with, and of the trustee. So a trust is going to be a much larger document. It's going to deal with many other kinds of circumstances, uh, how you would want the trustee to manage your assets should you become incapacitated, where you might want to live and so forth, where you might not want to live. You can give more instructions in the trust. And that's what this okay, slide Ed? is about. Yes. Yes, Ed. Okay, so now yeah. I have a question, and since you just uh, mentioned successor again, the question uh, says, if the primary person named as uh, power of attorney becomes incapacitated, does the successor POA go into effect immediately? How is that activated? And um, then I'll tag on, does this also, is this going to be the same answer for the trustees? Uh, I'll answer the second first, uh, question first. Yes, okay. um, um, generally, if if you have named a, an additional an agent and the agent becomes incapacitated, um, the 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 power of attorney is going to say that the the successor agent can then act. Um, um, so. Yes, they're, they're, they're the, the successor agent can immediately act um, and can immediately take over if the agent has been taken over. The question is, will a bank or a third party accept that? You may need some other proof that the initial agent has become incapacitated or has resigned. So sometimes I'll get a letter of resignation from an agent and say now the successor agent is is working. So that's how that works. A trust is going to have a little bit more detail in the trust. We go into more language about um, the resignation of the trustee, um, when the next trustee can act. So you can, it's a little bit more flexible, uh, but it's basically the same principle. The trustee, uh, the, the successor trustee will act when the initial trustee uh, is no longer able to act. Okay. Um, you might even okay. have a clause Thank you very much. trust that defines incapacity. That's one of the things I sometimes put into the trust. How do we determine incapacity of a trustee? Okay. All right. So um, we're kind of halfway through, which is a good point to begin to uh, transition over to the other legal tools for decision making. I've talked briefly and, 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 and you know, pretty much given you an outline of the kind of financial tools that we use, the durable power of attorney for financial matters and a trust and or a trust. Uh, and these are good mechanisms for managing assets when you become incapacitated. Uh, uh, how the agent acts, the duties upon the agent, the duties upon the trustee, the fiduciary duty they have to act for you and not for themselves. Uh, and they're vehicles in which they then manage assets for you. But that leaves out the medical decision making. And the basic tools for advanced planning for medical decision making is the medical power of attorney and the advanced medical directive, and I've got some initials by then. Now, 
often the medical power of attorney and an advanced medical directive are contained in one document. Okay. Uh, my, in my practice, I do two different documents just to make it a little bit less bulky and easier for people to understand. But many other attorneys just combine them into one document. But it's important that you still understand the difference. The medical power of attorney appoints an agent. Okay. So it points an agent who advocates on behalf of the principal. So you, as the principal, the maker of the document, appoint an agent. And they are your advocate who would act for you. The advanced medical directive is more like a set of instructions, usually discussing end-of-life decisions, which you discuss in the advanced medical directive. So think in general the medical power of attorney as a legal tool to appoint an agent and the advanced medical directive as a set of instructions, usually dealing with end-of-life situations. Okay, and now we'll go into more detail about each of these particular issues. Okay. So, what do you put in the medical power of attorney? Um, well, in my medical power of attorney and almost everyone else's medical power of attorneys that are competently done, uh, I have clauses about hiring health age and care managers. So there's going to be authority for the agent to employ medical personnel for you, uh, to admit you into a hospital, to a nursing or assisted living facility, uh, to hire home health care people and so forth. And of course, to be able to consult with medical providers and obtain all medical information. Okay. So those are the basic issues, basic authorities that we want to put in the medical power of attorney so that they can do all the things that you would do if you were managing your own health care, if you had capacity to manage your own health care. Um, who would you appoint as your agent? Well, you can, again, you can appoint any adult person you choose. The law doesn't tell you there's nothing in Virginia that says you have to name this person or that person. In Virginia law, you can name any adult person you choose. From a practical perspective, you should appoint somebody who is available, who's willing to do it, because if you appoint somebody who really is not going to do it, then it's all for naught, and also understands your attitudes towards healthcare. So you're going to want to be able to appoint somebody who understands you and what you want. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, again, the agent Ed, uh, has... Yes. Go ahead. I, I have Hello? a question about that. Sure. Yes, I got a question about that. Can, can you hear me? Um, yes, I can. So the question, the question is, I am um, the uh, MPA but the insurance company and doctor's offices are all asking for individual forms for, for themselves, and my loved one is no longer capacitated. Okay. Um, the power of attorney, uh, you can sign the other forms that they want as, as the agent for them. So they may give you other forms that they want signed, but now you can sign that as their agent. So if they have other documents that you, and I get that all the time when I serve as guard, when I serve as agent, um, there are other forms that they want me to sign. And I just sign uh, by, uh, I, sign the, I sign the principal's name by myself as agent. And then I give them a copy of the power of attorney and say they're okay. incapacitated and I now have authority to act. So that's how I deal with that. Um, um, hopefully that kind of answered the question. Um, you never know in situations. There's always the issue yes. about third parties and how they're going to react to the, to the power of attorney. And to be honest with you, remember, many third parties may not understand the law. 
they don't sometimes understand what the agent's authority is. And um, that's an issue. Uh, so we have to do a certain amount of education to the third party. That's um, if you talk to attorneys who talk about powers of attorneys, they're always talking about banks that refuse to honor the agent for a power of attorney they've done and all of the struggles they have with the bank. So there are, I mean, these are not perfect mechanisms. They're always lips in the road, but I think it's much better to have one than not to have one. Uh, so um, uh, there we go. Um, Advanced Medical Directive, which I have now on the screen, is a document which instructs medical providers as the type of care you would want or would not want. Okay, so usually this is talking about end of life procedures, whether or not you want uh, procedures to occur when you are in particular states. Of course, while you're alive and healthy, you might want everything to be done for you. But should you develop a terminal condition or should you be unconscious and in a uh, comatose or persistent vegetative state, then you may have instructions that I don't want to be kept alive unnecessarily at that point and would want certain kinds of treatments, certain kinds of life prolonging treatments, such as intravenous nutrition, intravenous uh, hydration or water withdrawn. And we're, we're talking about not drinking water out of a glass. We're talking about having fluids being provided to you uh, either through a nasal tube going down to your stomach or uh, a line in your veins. And at that point, you can say, uh, and the law, of course, uh, allows you to say in advance, if I'm in that state, then I don't want to have these things done for me uh, if they're just keeping me alive and my quality of life is so poor. So that's what the advanced medical directive often says. In Virginia, and this, I also want to talk about this in the context of power of attorney. A medical power of attorney is almost always a springing a power of attorney. Why do I say that? Because um, if you can talk to your doctor, the doctor's going to talk to you. Okay. It's only when you become incapacitated uh, is the agent then going to be really in authority to talk to the doctor. They may be, you, you can give the, the agent authority while you have capacity to talk to your doctor. That's certainly fine. But, um, but, but you know, usually uh, these go into effect when the doctor, the hospital can't communicate with you. And now, of course, the doctor or hospital has to turn to the agent that you've appointed. Okay. So for the AMD, the AMD is, uh, in order for it to go into effect, under Virginia law, two physicians, one of which is not involved with your direct care, has to make a determination that you are incapable of directing medical care decisions. And the other requirement of the ANT is it must be signed by an individual. There have to be two witnesses. That's it. It should be signed by you. It should be witnessed by two people. It should be dated. So it's pretty simple to uh, it's pretty simple to to execute one. And any uh, and this really applies for all of these documents. Any advanced medical directive legally executed in one state should be followed in any other state. OK, so um, even if the AMB, AMD in another state requires three people, the law throughout the United States say if I legally did it in Virginia correctly, it has to be recognized in North Carolina. So um, that's actually constitutional law uh, in which one state has to recognize uh, acts from another state that were legally done. So. Um, that kind of deals with the issues about um, when these documents, when the AMD goes into effect, when the medical power of attorney goes into effect. 
Um, so let's let's kind of go back and think about this uh, a little bit more holistically. Um, an AMD, again, is an instruction as the kind of treatment you want or would not want when you're not able to communicate. Now, if you're able to communicate, that's fine. Then, then you are telling the doctor what kind, what you would want and what you would not want. In fact, the statute provides uh, some mechanisms some, from when, when a person can say these things, how they can say these things directly to a doctor, uh, what they would want or not want, uh, particularly in the discontinuation of treatment. Uh, but w the, the issue what we're usually concerned about is when the person doesn't have capacity to talk to the doctor. Now, the AMP appoints somebody who can ensure that your wishes are followed. That's the, that's the reason you have an agent. The agent is to carry out your wishes. Now, not all of your wishes are going to be expressed in the uh, advanced medical directive. So I think it's important to have a conversation with your agent about end-of-life issues, what you would want, what not want. Uh, including what kind of care you would want or not want. Should you not be an end of life but need a lot of care? What would be your preferred uh, living choices and so forth? Um, uh, so this requires a, a conversation beyond whatever document that you've done. Um, and I talk about that there in the final paragraph that um, you want to talk about these issues uh, prior to the events happening, because we can't cover all possible circumstances. And there are many other kind of decision-making tools of things that, uh, that exist that can help a guided conversation about these kind of issues. They're not easy to talk about, but there are other particular ways of guiding you to talk about these kind of things. Um, <clears throat> So um, I think we're getting pretty close to the end of, of the prepared kind of statements. Um, but I wanted to leave about 10 minutes to come back and talk about things in a little bit more detail or to answer questions, even though we've been going through questions. I think I'd like to leave about 10 minutes to answer some follow-up questions that many of you might have. Uh, we've covered a lot of grounds. We've covered the power of attorney and the trust and the medical power of attorney and advanced directive. Uh, so with regard to these particular issues, um, if you have other questions, now's the time to uh, to uh, let me know. So Lucy, do you have any other yes. questions there? I do have another question. Um, is the advanced medical directive um, the question is, I filled out something called the five questions, and is that the same thing as an advanced medical directive? Um, it's now, been a wild Ed, are you familiar with this? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I, I wouldn't use that document to actually appoint somebody, but one of the good thing about the five questions is it's a form that has a guided discussion about when I'm talking to you about your feelings about end of life decisions, the five questions has questions in there that make you think about end of life decisions. So what I think that's a good for is, is I think it's a good guide to have for a discussion. Uh, so that's where I would use okay. the five questions. Okay. But it's not a legal document. I think there is, it's been a while, I think you can do an advanced medical directive. I think you could do in it a medical power of attorney. Uh, so I don't want to say absolutely no. Um, but um, I think it's it's even, uh, what I have used it for with clients is to discuss end of life issues. Okay. Okay. Uh, and by the way, if you and go to the hospital, you go to a hospital, they're going to ask if you have an advanced medical directive or, or, or a medical power of attorney. And they may have forms for you if you want to do it under the law. And this is actually a law from 1991, if you can believe it. 
uh, in which they have to ask that question. And if you don't have it and want to do it, they have to have forms for you to do it. Okay. If you can do it, if you have the capacity to do it. That's only the, that has to do with the medical decision making. Okay. Other questions? Yes, I have I have a few more questions. Okay. Um, does the do not resuscitate belong in the advanced medical directives? Uh, I put a do not resuscitate in these documents. So it goes into that. Um, uh, so yes, I do put in, uh, what I do is I give the agent authority to uh, order a DNR. So the agent would have authority to do that. Um, would have authority okay. with regard to the DNR. So that's how I handle that particular issue. And yes, it should be part of the medical power of attorney. All right. Um, the next question, is a family trust the same as a revocable trust? Um, probably in the context in which the person is is asking the question, they probably are they they probably are the same. So what is what? Why do I use the revocable? Revocable means that you, as the trust maker, can revoke the trust, as opposed to doing an irrevocable trust, which means that you, as the trust maker, can't revoke the trust. One of the things I didn't talk about when talking about a revocable trust are tax issues. So the one particular rule that I want you to understand that when you do a revocable trust and you transfer your assets into the trust, the IRS doesn't treat the trust as a completed gift or as a, a document that would need a separate tax ID number, okay? Because it can be easily revoked. So assets in a revocable trust, your bank accounts, your investment accounts, your taxes are going to be done exactly the same as they're done without a revocable trust. You're going to do a 1040. You're going to report the income that's been earned in the trust. There's no, not going to be any change with regard to that because the IRS sees it as just a see-through document. They say, well, a person could revoke it, so we're going to let them file their taxes just like they didn't have a trust. Uh, so you don't need a separate tax ID number with regard to the trust. Now, when you do an irrevocable trust, now you've done a completed gift, and that's going to need a separate tax ID number, and it's taxed separately from you, the maker of the trust, from your own uh, personal um, um, uh, assets. So, and there are different reasons as to why people do revocable, uh, an irrevocable trust, which is really for a different lecture. But I just wanted to make that that plain, and that's sometimes a concept that people don't quite understand. That's why they're a little bit hesitant to doing a revocable trust. Other questions? Okay. All right. I have. Um, uh, the next question, when would a trust be needed in the first place? Okay, that's a very uh, good question. Um, it's a really good question. And it really depends on a number of different issues. One, is the person comfortable with the idea? I, you know, if a person says, I'm really not comfortable with doing a trust, it's more than I want to do, I don't quite understand it, uh, I, I, I am hesitant to have somebody do a trust. Um, it is a particularly good tool to use. I, I often advise it when people have more than one piece of property, uh, particularly if they have a piece of property in another state. And I'm talking about real property, land, because um, get rid of that. Um, because you don't want to have to do pro. One of the one of the reasons doing a trust is to avoid probate. Okay. And if you have property in different states, you're going to have to do probate in both states, which can be a little bit long, complicated, expensive. Then it becomes a good idea to put property into a trust 
so that upon one's death, the property goes immediately to the beneficiaries or is managed for the beneficiaries. Uh, I also think it's a very good vehicle if you have a significant amount of property, you want to avoid the probate process, uh, and you want to make it simple and easier to transfer property to your loved ones upon your death. Uh, one of the one of the reasons people do revocable trust is to avoid probate. The first case is is the person going to have any kind of probate estate or not? They may not. Um, a probate means that it's a it's a court transfer of your property to beneficiaries under the law. That's what probate means. Uh, when you do a trust, you avoid that process for any of the assets in the trust. Now, if you're not gonna, if you're gonna do a trust and you're not gonna transfer your property eventually into the trust, then you've, you know, you've not, we've not really done anything for you because you, then you're gonna probate your estate, your estate's gonna go into your trust and that trust's gonna uh, distribute it. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So you have to be, you have to understand that I'm actually gonna have my bank accounts and I'm actually gonna put them under the name of the trust. And some people are just not comfortable with that. So. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Yes, um, and this will be our last question. Um, let me pull it back up, I'm sorry. As a daughter making end of life decisions for my mother per her AMD, I feel a little exposed if I follow the directive and not ask for extraordinary measures because I also inherit her estate. Is this a legal issue? You can be the agent and you can inherit the person's estate. There's nothing in the law that says that's illegal to be a blood relative that's gonna inherit the state and do end of life decisions. No, the point of the end of life decisions and no, is what your mother wants. It's not what you want, it's what your mother directed you to do. And there, I think you, if you're if you're going to do it, then you have an obligation to to follow your mother's directions, even if you're going to be uh, inheriting the estate. Okay. Any other questions? Um, Hello. We are go. Yes, we're we're going to wrap this up because it's uh, now one o'clock. And okay. I want to thank everybody um, for coming. And also, I would like to tell you, as you sign out of the webinar, there will be a brief survey. We would appreciate you uh, responding to the survey. And Ed, especially, I want to thank you for providing us with all that valuable information. Um, I look forward to having you back with us in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all very much. I enjoyed it a great deal and um, I'm happy to help anybody that uh, needs some help with regard to these issues. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you.